I'll just start it now so we'll have it. Welcome everybody. If you want to put your local league's name, um, you know, the name of your local league next to your name, that would be great. Just helps people get acquainted. We'll start at seven o'clock. We've got about three minutes. Always trying to get this picture just right. You know, we want the right background, lighting. <laughs> Got to look good, right, guys? <laughs> Is Trisha here? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I can't see anymore. You did. If you want to stop sharing your screen for a minute, Judy, it might be nice for people to see who all's here. Yeah, okay. there we go. Then you can see everybody. And Maria's here. <laughs> hey, guys. Yeah. I know, and this makes everybody fix our hair. And, <laughs> you know, how's the makeup look? You know, in the world, oh, yeah, what know. makeup? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we know how to mute everybody who's not talking. Do that. Um, no, because then I'll have to unmute you when you do. We'll just ask everybody to mute. The northern, some of the northern leagues were featured in a publication this week, um, highlighting women, <clears throat> Women's History Month. It was northern lower Michigan, Manistee, Trisha was in it, and Grand Traverse was in it. That's wonderful. It's great. I think that it was titled Beyond the Ballot. So it was Christina, by the way. Um, oh, all right. Being modest, they're not mentioning her name. <laughs> nice. It was really about the leagues. Well, people are the leagues. That's, you know, the people are important. That's for sure. Our president, Robin, is presenting at the college on um, the League of Women Voters, the history of the League of Women Voters really this nice. month. That's great. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I think Ren Travers is outnumbering everybody. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> It's seven o'clock. Oh, just wait. We've got people coming in. Mm -hmm. but, um, Denise will handle that. And maybe I'll go ahead and get started with the introductions. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the Advocacy Committee presenting information about what's happened in the legislature. Uh, since the beginning of January. And uh, my name's Judy Karanjeff, and I'm the Vice President for Advocacy for the League of Women Voters of Michigan, and I'm Chair of the Advocacy Committee. And Connie, would you like to go next? Yes, I'd be happy to. Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to let you know 
that these are the women who are members of the advocacy committee. And next to each name, you will see the area that they watch very closely to determine whether we need to have action or whether we need to be educated on issues, et cetera. And you should know that I'm going to quote uh, from the Shining, a uh, Shining a Light was, was written by Judy Duffy, who is the LWVUS Advocacy Committee Chair, who said she joined the LWV because she saw how it could impact public policy for the better at the local, state, and national levels. How the League, through its program, can consistently and loudly speak out on issues that are at their heart ones of equality, opportunity, transparency, good governance, and common sense. That is what the LWVMI Advocacy Committee seeks to do through its work. Thank you. You are all very aware that politics and issues are very fluid. They move very rapidly and they're very important to be watched. So we want to share with you today what has happened since the new year began. So please listen as advocacy, advocacy committee members share very exciting and interesting information on many important issues, laws, and events we are following. Thank you. Thank you, Connie, for that introduction. And I, I'm Maria Wollison. I'm a member of the local league of Oakland area. And I always like to brag right off the top of the head that um, we have 60, 60, that's six zero communities and 27 school districts that we represent. And just so you know, we were a little bit busy this past uh, election season. In 2023, we did 15 candidate forums and I'm sure we'll be doing a whole lot more that we're already planning for 2024. But now I'd like to start out with what is the Michigan legislature? It is basically consists of the House is tied with 54 Democrats and 54 Republicans. And then there, the special election on April 16th is certified and two new members from the districts 13 and 25 will be sworn in. And the Senate is still at 20 Democrats and 18 Republicans. Next slide, please. Okay. I uh, just wanna go over the proposed ballot proposals. Uh, the Legal Women Voter Michigan opposes and urges voters to decline to sign this petition that aims to overturn legislation, which was passed late last year, giving state regulators, not municipal governments, final say over large scale solar and wind projects. Uh, I always like to uh, let people think about the numbers that are involved. They have to get 356,958 valid signatures turned in by May 29th of 2024. So please decline to sign this petition. All right, moving on to the next one. The LWVMI opposes and urges voters to decline to sign the petition that will nullify the red flag laws that were passed last year. And again, they have until the end of the session in March, 2025 to do that one. And finally, the, um, the Michigan, Legal Women Voters Michigan opposes and urges voters to decline to sign this petition that would amend the Michigan Constitution to eliminate property taxes. Again, this amendment needs 446,198 valid signatures by July 8th, 2024. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Trisha. Trisha, go ahead. Hi, I am Trisha Denton. I'm a member of the Leland County League of Women Voters, and I have the privilege and honor as, of serving as the president currently. I'm also uh, the Michigan and Lake Michigan Interleague representative on the Oil and Water Don't Mix steering committee, which has been working diligently for the past, I lose track of how many years I've been involved for seven um, in hoping to get 
Line 5 shut down. Um, a few updates for you on that uh, over the past year and most recently, I was able to attend a large delegation to our um, U.S. Capitol um, hosted by Sierra Club, where we were able to convene with other folks from across the nation, including indigenous groups, um, to formulate strategies and plans for um, uh, continuing our David and Goliath battle. Um, as the conclusion of that uh, event, we were able to actually meet with uh, legislators in uh, at the U.S. Capitol and present a forum on Capitol Hill for uh, aides and uh, representatives and senators to educate them on the national significance of the need to protect the Great Lakes and support sovereignty of states and tribal nations. Uh, the League was able to, um, as a result of our involvement with the coalition, uh, sign on to a letter to our U.S. congressional representatives and senators, strongly urging them to tell the Biden administration that it must revoke the presidential permit for Line 5 and stand with the American people in a huge legal battle, as they said, pitting big oil against American state and tribal sovereignty. Um, we also had the... Uh, benefit of being able to join in on a coalition letter to the U.S. Department of Transportation, citing concerns that the remaining staff at Enbridge, after a sharp uh, layoff reduction in their force, um, questioning whether they would have the capacity to protect the line. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to turn it back over to Connie. Thank you. On January 24th of this year, our Governor Gretchen Whitmer made her State of the State Address. These are some of the highlights from her proposals as she spoke that evening. She wants $1.4 billion to build a rehab rehabilitate housing. Did you know that most of the housing in the state of Michigan is built before 1970? And that mortgage rates are kind of out of control, which keeps people from getting houses and uh, paying rent. She also has proposed free pre-K. That would help increase the amount of achievement, academic achievement that we have in our schools in the state. It would also make sure that our children get the best opportunity to go to kindergarten already prepared for that kind of learning. Finally, uh, next is the $5,000 income tax credit for family caregivers. If any of you have ever been in the position of being a caregiver, you know that it is stressful, it is demanding, and it is expensive. So what she has proposed is that everyone who is a caregiver and will meet certain standards will receive a $5,000 income tax credit for the family. I know that you have been all uh, awry sometimes when you're driving because of these roads that are being repaired, but she wants to finish spending that road money. You remember her, her, uh, thing was fix the damn roads. Well, she's been doing it, but she's been fixing the roads that bring in the most economic value to our state. And that's why you have seen the major thoroughfares being repaired. 
Tax credits for research and development. She is bound and determined that Michigan will stand ahead of everyone when it comes to industry and other areas that make our state great. And she has developed a program that will give tax credits to companies that do research and development that can become all kinds of interesting uh, ventures for our state. She wants to revive the Good Jobs for Michigan program. And finally, she wants to give rate rebates for buying a new car, which is really great. So this is Judy, and I'm going to talk about reproductive freedom. <clears throat> On November 8th, Right to Life of Michigan filed a federal lawsuit in the Western District of Michigan against the governor and other officials to invalidate Proposal 3 saying that it created an illegitimate super right to abortion. On March 19th, the governor filed a response. And back in November, the attorney general asked that it be dismissed. And yesterday, the attorney general, the secretary of state, and the governor filed another request that it gets uh, be uh, dismissed. So we'll continue to watch this case. On February 6th, Northland Family Planning Clinic and the Center for Reproductive Rights and a few others filed a lawsuit challenging three of the abortion restrictions still in Michigan law. The three uh, parts that they are challenging are part of the 24-hour waiting period law. They want to uh, get rid of the 24-hour waiting period they want to get rid of the biased counseling that they believe is uh, required under that law. And they want to get rid of the prohibition that um, pra advanced practice practitioners can perform abortions, can't perform abortions. So they have three issues they've raised in the lawsuit. There's been no hearing yet. It's in. Michigan Court of Claims. And on March 26th, we'll be watching the U.S. Supreme Court when they hear a case on the use of the abortion pill, Ms. Mifepristone. You've probably all heard about this case. They're saying the FDA did not do enough research. Just for your information, 63% of all abortions in the United States last year, in 2023, were performed using mifepristone, according to the gut marker research that was released yesterday. So now I'll go to Maria. Maria? Maria, you're muted. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, so sorry. Thank you, Judy. Uh, I just want to hit the highlights that are in the governor's uh, budget of 2024. Pre-K program for four-year-old children, free community college, 2.5 increase in university and community college funding, increase in family planning funds, and free school lunch. And Judy, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. I'll talk about the Freedom of Information Act. Hopefully all of you already know about this. But on February 7th, the Senate Oversight Committee had a hearing on Senate Bills 669 and 670. And this would require open records in the governor's office and the legislature. The league supported it. These bills have been worked on for almost 10 years, bipartisanly, with Senators McBroom and Senator Moss. If you want to see a good hearing, you could go back and replay that on the Senate website. Uh, just this uh, March 13th, the bills were substituted and reported by the committee. We sent an action alert to all of you on March 15th about this issue. The bills are now waiting action in the Senate. And then they will go to the House uh, for hopefully passage there and then to the governor. Only two states don't have this type of law. Hmm. Next, we'll go to Connie. 
In February of this year, these laws were passed without immediate effect. Without immediate effect means that they will wait 40 days after its reception and then 90 days after the end of the session in which it was enacted. Then the bills will become law. But if it has immediate effect, it means it goes directly to the governor without any time wasted. But these were the bills that were passed in 2023 without immediate effect that will become law if they haven't already. Bills on climate change, firearm safety, juvenile justice, reproductive choice, and voting rights. And now our members will share information on each of those areas. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Connie. Um, right, and just to clarify, those laws all became came into effect on February 13th of this year. So um, I, I work in the area of climate and environmental protection. And so I'm so pleased to say that in November of last year, Governor Whitmer signed seven new climate change laws. These laws and these laws went into effect on fe in February uh, of this year. So here are the highlights. The first of the, and one of the most important laws is the 100% clean energy standard. This is Public Act 235 and it's put, puts Michigan on track for 60% renewable energy by 2035 and 100% carbon free energy by 2040. This is a big win for fighting climate change in Michigan and it will help our, our future generations have a chance for a life on a livable planet and maybe even a chance to experience cold and snowy winters in Michigan. The next law in the climate package is improving energy efficiency. That's Public Act 229. This will help improve energy efficiency and reduce energy waste. We all know the cheapest, cleanest energy is the energy we don't use. So this law requires that all energy providers reduce their energy waste. So then going on to the next slide, the Next law in the clean energy package is about worker transition to clean energy jobs. This is Public Act 232. It will help Michigan workers train for the clean energy future. This law establishes the Office of Worker and Community Economic Transition to help workers and communities take full advantage of clean energy jobs. The next laws in this package are streamlining clean energy projects. These are Public Acts 233 and 234. These laws streamline the approval process for large scale wind and solar energy projects. These are the projects we need for, for in Michigan for transition to clean energy. These laws make sure local governments maintain local control by requiring developers to first work with local governments to get their projects approved. However, if the local governments don't follow the law's standards for approval, then the developer can ask for review by the Michigan Public Service Commission. I just wanna pause for a minute to remind everyone that the League opposes the ballot pet petition put forward by Citizens for Local Choice. This petition would overturn these two laws that I just described on streamlining energy projects. The League opposes the petition Thanks, to the buddy need these laws to be sure Michigan gets to 100% clean energy by 2040 to save our planet. And finally, a law for climate and equity in Michigan Public Service Commission's decisions. Public Act 231 authorizes the Michigan Public Service Commission to consider climate and equity in its regulatory decisions. Isn't it amazing that the MPSC wasn't authorized to consider climate and equity before now? And finally, a companion law Public Act 230 protects farmers' rights to host solar projects on their own land. So lots of good new laws adopted last year to fight climate change and protect our environment. So now I'll turn the program back over, over to Christina. Thank you, Sandra. My name is Christina Schlitt, past president, co-president of the State League and proud co-president of the Grand Travers League, along with Cheryl Naparella. Um, there are five new firearm safety laws that became effective February 13th this year, along with the others. First one is secure storage. That requires individuals to keep unattended weapons unloaded and locked with a locking device or stored in a locked box or container if it is reasonably known that a minor 
um, is has access, would have access. Gun safety devices is the next one. The cost of gun safety devices will be lowered to allow easier access to materials needed to safely store firearms. And many advocacy groups are also um, handing out safety locks um, free of charge. The next is background checks. It expands background checks related to firearm purchases to all firearm purchases from handguns to long guns. Previously, universal background checks were only required when purchasing a handgun in Michigan. Red flag laws were established to established extreme protection order laws, also known as the red flag laws. Red flag laws are designed to help and prevent a person in distress or crisis from using a firearm to inflict damage on themselves or others. The laws do not seek to take firearms away from gun owners who are not dangerous or in distress. And domestic violence regulations they prohibit individuals convicted of a misdemeanor related to domestic violence from possessing firearms for at least an eight year period. Existing Michigan law prohibited those convicted of felony domestic violence from possessing firearms. And now I'd like to turn this over to Carolyn Madden. Are you muted? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. I'm Carolyn Madden. I'm a member of the Washtenaw uh, County League of Women Voters and a member of the State Advocacy Group. And I represent criminal justice and juvenile justice. Uh, so we've had a big win, too. While criminal justice for adults is slow moving, the juvenile justice at least moved forward with a big win. So in uh, 1922, July 1922, the Task Force on Juvenile Justice Reform was formed by Governor Whitmer and led by Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist. And they took a look at the state system and released its report with 32 recommendations for improving Michigan's juvenile justice system. And then in December of this- can't play right now. Excuse me? Go ahead. Uh, is okay. Yeah. Sorry. So in December of 2023, the Justice for Kids and Communities Act was signed into law. That bill, those bills, and there were many of them, probably almost 19, I believe, um, broaden access to diversion for juvenile justice so that they don't have to spend time in prison or to at least uh, offer alternatives for prison for juveniles. Uh, eliminates most costs associated with juvenile legal system, which would put juveniles back in the system if they weren't able to pay for their legal fees. And it raises the amount of money for community-based care. So instead of the state taking care of all juveniles all over, it uh, provides more money per county. And then mandates a risk and needs assessment before dis disposition for every juvenile. And I'm going to just, uh, in the uh, right here is the uh, Michigan Center for Youth Justice, which has a thorough examination of what the recommendations were and what was passed. And I put that in the uh, chat, if you'd like to get a better look at what juvenile justice, how it's changed and how it's moving forward. Thank you. And I'll pass it back to Judy. So we have some new laws on reproduction. They repealed uh, there was a package of nine bills, and some of the bills uh, that I'll mention are they removed the trap laws from uh, the, the law. Trap laws were the ones that were in place that said like the hallway had to be a certain width and the ceiling had to be a certain height. And that was done specifically to close abortion providers in the state that couldn't meet the requirements. They also repealed the old outdated law that we all heard about from 1931. They started, they took out the language that banned accurate information at public universities. So now they'll have access to accurate information about reproductive health options. And they repealed the law that forced patients to buy a separate insurance rider for abortion. So that was good news. 
Remember, 56.65% of the voters supported that proposal in 2022. So now we'll go to uh, voting rights. And I know a lot of you here have given speeches about this and know these wells, but just as a reminder, uh, the law went into effect to allow the Feb February presidential primary on February 27th, during which time we got to make sure that we had secure drop boxes under a new law. We had early voting under a new law. We now have a permanent mail ballot list under the new law. And just recently, you can begin pre-registering for 16 and 17 year olds. Another new law that you might not be aware of that's going into effect is the financial disclosure requirements for elected officials. We did these with Promote the Vote and the league was actively involved but there's two websites that have a ton of information about these laws, uh, WW Michigan Voting and WW Promote the Vote. Then I'll go to go to Maria. And I remembered to unmute myself. Okay, so what do we have to look forward to? What legislation might actually move. Uh, here's basically the schedule for the Michigan legislature. You've got spring recess, which is March 22 to April 10th for the House, March 22 to April 9th for the Senate, and you got break for the summer, June 27th. So we have a lot to do in a very short time. And now Sandy's going to take it over. Thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, so what's on the agenda for the environment this year? We got a lot done in 2023, but we still have a lot to do to protect our environment. So I'll give you a brief summary of some of the environmental bills the league supports that still need action in the Michigan legislature. First, there's community solar. These bills are near and dear to my heart because I'd love to put solar panels on my house, but I'm surrounded by trees and the solar companies won't even talk to me. The community solar bill in, introduced again last year by Senators Jeff Irwin and Ed McBroom and Representative Rachel Hood would allow people who can't install their own solar panels because they rent or live in shady areas or can't afford the upfront cost to join a community solar project. Maybe something built out at the airport on, or on some farm field. And the people who join these community solar projects will get credits against their electric bill for the energy the community solar project puts back into the grid. The next bills we're following are regulating septic systems. It's a sad thing to realize that Michigan is the only state in the nation without a statewide septic code. Not having septic system regulation allows hundreds of thousands of leaking septic systems to dirty our pure Michigan waters. These four bills would require inspection of septic systems every five years and create a fund to help customers pay the cost of inspections and correcting the problems. Going on to our next slide, uh, the next bills would allow go local governments to ban single use plastic bags. Did you know that an estimated 22 million pounds of plastic waste ends up in the Great Lakes? <laughs> and a large part of this is single use plastic bags like you get from the grocery stores. Plastic bags break down as microplastics that end up being ingested by wildlife and humans. And we're just beginning to understand the bad health effects of these microplastics. These bills are important because they would allow local governments to ban or restrict single use plastic bags. And finally, the very important polluter pay bills. This is a seven bill package just introduced by Senator Irwin and Representative Jason Morgan. Michigan is in serious need of stronger laws to stop polluters from just walking away from their messes as they've been doing in Michigan for years. So these bills would set strict cleanup standards, increase transparency, require businesses that use polluting materials to post an upfront bond to cover potential cleanup costs and give people exposed to toxic substances the right to medical monitoring and fairer access to the courts. So we have a lot of envir environmental bills to watch again this year. And I'll turn the program over to Christina. Thank you, Sandra. Upcoming, we have a combination of firearm safety and voting rights bills. 
House Bills 4127 and 4128 prohibiting firearms and elections site had a hearing and vote to report in Senate Elections and Ethics Committee and passed the Senate. They are now awaiting final approval of Senate changes in the House. And a couple of good news items I'd like to share. Governor Whitmer appointed Jennifer De La Cruz from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to a newly created Office of Community Violence Intervention Services. This new department will lead our statewide efforts to reduce gun violence and save lives. Ms. De La Cruz has an extensive background in community violence prevention and a proactive approach to building partnerships to reduce adverse outcomes. Another good news item is a change in the gun recycling program. The previous program did not include destruction of the guns totally. Only the frame and the receiver were destroyed. The other parts were sold on the internet, often without serial numbers and fueling the trade in ghost guns. A new disposable program by the Michigan State Police will completely pulverize firearms turned in for any reason, including buyback programs, crime scenes, and obsolete service weapons. And now, Back to Carolyn Madden. Carolyn? Yeah, thank you. And I think I unmuted myself also. Um, so the juvenile task force recommended 32 recommendations, bills passed, except for one bill. And that bill is um, bills 46, House Bill 4630. And that bill supports providing adequate defense for youth. So you know, we have a statewide um, discussion about uh, defense, indigent defense, but there is no particular uh, defense for juvenile public defense statewide. And so this bill would do that. What's holding it up is money, which is what holds up a lot of bills. Uh, but um, we're working towards it. And again, I put in the uh, Michigan Center for Youth Justice is working very hard to get this bill passed so that the juveniles have as much access to public defense as uh, adults do. And whoops. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, and then the other bills that um, are looming, um, biggest one is uh, that's getting a real look recently, second look. It says Second Chance Sentencing Act, but it's also referred to as second look. And that bill, I uh, just had a hearing two days ago and Judy was nice enough to see part of it. And, and I am putting in the chat the actual a hearing that was held yesterday at the uh, two days ago at the criminal justice uh, committee. It's really an informative, uh, if you have time really to listen to a little bit, you'll hear about how much is spent on mass incarceration in Michigan. And we have one of the highest rates of mass incarceration in the United States. We have one of the longest, the state with one of the longest sentencing um, sentences uh, for, and also a very large number of lifers in Michigan. This bill would have people who've been in prison for over 10 years, a second look. The judge who is actually sentenced them would look at it. It's not an easy, uh, people are complaining that it's an easy out for violent offenders. It's not an easy out. It's just a second look for some people. So please, if you get a chance, take a look at that. The other uh, is the to eliminate life without parole for youth under 19 in the United States. They have already passed something like this, but in uh, states rights allow for states to still have life without parole. Not It's not mandatory, but you can still do it. So this would eliminate life without parole for youth under 19. And the last one that I'll talk about is prisoner gerrymandering. So uh, there are some states that you can actually vote while in prison. That's uh, Maine and Vermont. And now it's Washington, DC. The rest of the states are working, not all of them, but a number of them are working first to end prisoner gerrymandering. So many of you know that um, if, if you're in a prison, so for example, the women's prison is in Washtenaw County. So Washtenaw County gets all the numbers uh, of almost 2000 women counted towards their representation. But a lot of these women, of course, are not from Washtenaw County, they're from other places. So that's would end prisoner gerrymandering. And that's the first step before you can get to voting in prison, which is another big step. 
And just interesting is that other states are moving towards this. So I'm hoping that uh, the bill will get a further hearing. It has already had one hearing. Uh, other states, for example, Montana has passed, uh, you know, a bill to end prisoner gerrymandering. So we're looking at this, lots of other bills coming up too, but uh, it's a long time with criminal justice. So thank you. And I'll pass back to, I think it's Tricia, right? Yeah. So uh, what can you do on line five? Uh, if you haven't yet, you absolutely must see the documentary film, Bad River. It's airing uh, nationally at AMC theaters. Check your local listing to see when it will show or be shown at your theater or request that it be shown. Um, it's been selling out everywhere that I've heard it's playing. It's a riveting new documentary about the Wisconsin Bad River Band and its ongoing fight for sovereignty. Um, also this morning, uh, March 21st, our uh, Attorney General Dana Nessel delivered arguments in federal court, court in Ohio to return the live line five decision back to state court. Supporters of the shutdown of Line 5 attended by the bus load in solidarity for state rights to protect the public trust. So what can you do? Um, watch the film and then continue to lobby President Biden oh. to revoke the presidential permit. Uh, lobby our senators to let the president know that they've got his back if he makes this needed decision. Stay tuned for court decisions on line five. And um, I'm going to drop in the chat right now the web address for oilandwaterdontmix.org. You can find uh, links to the recordings of the um, arguments from Dana Nessel, scripts for how to write letters to the editor um, or your congressional delegation or even the president. So check out that website for all information needed to become the best advocate you can be for protecting our Great Lakes. Um, if you've got a special interest in the Great Lakes watershed, I encourage you to join the LWVUS water team, climate specialty water team group, which meets monthly on the first Monday of each month. Uh, at 11 a.m. You can find more information on that by contacting me or by checking out the LWV US website. Um, it's fascinating the things we can learn from uh, water warriors from across the nation and how they're being successful in advocating for water protection. We're all in this together. I'll pass it off to Sue now. Thanks, Tricia. I'm Sue Smith. I'm a member of the Washtenaw County League and the State Advocacy Committee. I'm also the State uh, League lead on National Popular Vote. Using the National League position, the State League supports electing the president by means of the National Popular Vote Compact. We support House Bills 4156 and 4540 and Senate Bills 126 and 295. Passing these bills will enable Michigan to join the National Popular Vote Compact. The State League is part of the National Popular Vote Michigan Coalition, 
which has been working on a legislative campaign to get these bills passed. The House bills have passed the House Elections Committee, and we are encouraging Speaker Tate to bring them to a vote on the House floor as soon as the two new House members are sworn in after the April special election. As you know, right now the House is 50-50. We and other members of the coalition have reached out to Senator Moss, chair of the Senate Elections and Ethics Committee, asking for a committee hearing on the Senate bills. As you may remember, the compact does not go into effect until the number of electoral college votes among the states belonging to the compact equals 270. As of today, there are 195. Michigan's joining the compact with its 15 electoral college votes would not be enough for the National Popular Vote Compact to take effect in 2024. And now I'll turn over to Judy. Of course, we continue to work with our coalition and promote the vote <clears throat> on some more voting rights bills. Uh, we're working right now on Senate Bill 603 and 604. Our uh, co-president Paula Bowman gave testimony recently to clarify the recount procedures in Michigan. Yesterday, the bills came out of committee and are now on the Senate floor. We also are hopeful that Michigan will adopt a Voting Rights Act, Senate Bills 401 through 404. They've been assigned to the Senate Elections and Ethics Committee, and we anticipate hearings in the spring. Recently, you may have seen the Republican National Committee filed a lawsuit alleging that Michigan is not in compliance with the National Voting Rights Act that requires the voting registration rolls to be clean. We'll be watching that and have more information later. There also is a new financial disclosure information available on the Secretary of State's website. She created a special web place for it under personal financial disclosure. This is something the League worked for when we helped pass Proposal 1 in 2022. This will contain personal finance, financial information about elected officials that are serving in the House and the Senate as of April 15th. And on May 15th, it will have the same disclosure information for candidates. Now I'll turn it over to Connie. Honey, on mute. No, I'm off. Okay. So what's happening with the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission? Susan Smith has been our eyes and ears, faithfully attending and watching the proceedings of the commission from day one. So we consider her our resident expert. She will now give us an update. Thanks, Connie. I need to point out that there are a team of league members who are watching these uh, many meetings since September, and some of them are sitting here in the meeting tonight. In 2022, the AG versus Benson lawsuit was filed by 19 Detroit voters in the Western District of the Federal District Court. The plaintiffs claimed that the Hickory House map was unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The plaintiffs also claimed that the MICRC had violated the Federal Voting Rights Act. A six-day trial was held in Kalamazoo in November of 2023. The case was heard by a three-judge panel. In December of 2023, the court ruled that seven House districts and six Senate districts were unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment because race was a major factor when the MICRC drew the maps for those districts. The court said it was not necessary for them to rule on the violation of the Federal Voting Rights Act claim because of the ruling the court gave on the 14th Amendment claim. 
As a result, the MICERC received no guidance on the appropriate Black voting age population percentage to use when drawing Voting Rights Act districts. On January 8th, <clears throat> pardon me, on January 8th, 2024, the court issued scheduling orders for both parties and for the two special masters who were appointed by the court. March 1st was the deadline for the commission to submit their final house map to the court, which they did. A drawing special master was also required to submit a house map by March 1st in case the court rejected the commission's house map. Plaintiffs had until March 8th to file any objections they had to the commission's final map, which they also did. The, mark, the MICRC had until March 15th to file a response to the plaintiff's objections with the court, which they also did. The reviewing special master had until March 15th to submit his review of the MICRC's final map. His report was generally positive. Therefore, he did not review the house map drawn by the drawing special master as a backup plan. Of course, the court has the final word and the court has until March 29th to approve a remedial house redistricting plan. Following the instructions from the court, the MICRC redrew the maps for State House Districts 1, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, and 14. They did so without knowing the racial makeup of the districts until after the maps had been completed. As required by the court, the commission held two public hearings in Detroit on their 10 draft proposed maps in February. Since the maps affected not only the city of Detroit, but also voters in Macomb, Oakland, and out county, Wayne County, the State League alerted local league presidents in those counties about the public hearings. On February 28th, the MICRC voted to submit the Motown Sound FC-E1 house map to the court, meeting the constitutional requirement of a yes vote by the majority of the commissioners present, including at least two Republicans, two Democrats, and two independents. Those of us watching were a little concerned when the first vote failed due to having received only one of the two required Republican votes. Fortunately, the map was approved on the second vote, 10 to three, with two of the four Republicans, all four Democrats, and four of the five independents voting yes. While the court required that only seven districts be redrawn, it was necessary for the MICRC to adjust some adjoining districts as well in order to redraw the required ones. As a result, 14 house districts were redrawn. 14 state reps are looking at potentially representing some different constituents. This has had an impact on our ability to get some of the bills we support, like the national popular vote, for example, approved. As you can see, the filing deadline for the August primary is April 23rd, and some House candidates won't know until March 29 what their district will look like. Of course, it also creates a burden for the Secretary of State's office and local clerks. According to the court ruling, six Senate districts 1, 3, 6, 8, 10, and 11 are unconstitutional and must be redrawn. Since the redrawn Senate districts won't take effect until 2026, the commission potentially has more time to draw them. By April 12th, the MICRC and the plaintiffs must jointly submit to the court a timeline for redrawing the maps for those six Senate districts 
plus any adjoining districts as necessary. At this morning's commission meeting, they approved a draft schedule which will be submitted to the plaintiffs for discussion and approval and then jointly submitted to the court by April 12th. According to their draft schedule, the commission would start redrawing the Senate district maps on April 18th and vote on their final map on July 30th. Following the same process as when it redrew the House maps, the commission must submit its final map to the court for approval according to the final timeline and the court's order. As you can see, when uh, the courts get involved, a lot of additional constraints are put on the commission in terms of its work. And it's been very challenging, I think, for the commission to meet the court's requirements, as well as, of course, um, the requirements of the Constitution following the criteria and so forth. So um, they got through the House. Now we'll see what happens with the Senate. And now I'll turn it over to Judy. I think Maria. I don't know. No, I think it wasn't Judy. Was it Maria? Yep. Yeah. And, and, and Susan, I want to thank you for that incredibly detailed analysis of what is going on and the fact that you just keep at it. You're constantly watching what's going on. Uh, at this point in time, we want to share with you what are the League of Women Voters Michigan educational networks doing? And the first one uh, we're going to be talking about is from Sandra. Sandra, please go ahead. Well, thanks, Maria. Um, yeah, so how do we keep up with all the important information about climate change and environmental protection? Well, fortunately, the League has established a statewide environmental network. <coughs> Our leagues include members from all over Michigan. We meet for an hour on the third Thursday of each month via Zoom to talk about what our local leagues are doing to fight climate change and protect our environment. It's really inspiring to hear about the good work our members are doing from Marquette to Copper Country to the Grand Traverse area, the Thumb, Southwest Michigan, Southeast Michigan, Mid Michigan, all over Michigan. So, and with spring officially starting this week, I want to invite you all to join us for our next environmental network meeting on April 18th at 11 a.m. Carol Gagliardi of Wild Ones has a beautiful PowerPoint presentation that will explain how everyone in Michigan can learn to use native plants to benefit wildlife, our environment, and our planet. So I put the link to register for this program in the chat, and it's also available on the League website under our work uh, environmental network. And remember, all League members are welcome to join our environmental network. You can learn more at the League website, and I put that link in the chat as well. So now I'll hand the program back to Christina. And once again, Sandra, thank you. The Firearm Safety Network um, was pretty much originated last summer. And this network um, is very proficiently chaired by Vicki Paulison. And we meet the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. You can check the dates for the future meetings on lwvmi.org, as well as checking out previous meetings which have been recorded, such as the January 10th Adolescent Targeted Violence Prevention Program um, put on by MSU. February 13th was the Firearm Prevention Institute by the University of Michigan. And our next meeting is April 9th at 7 p.m. All recordings are available at the state website, lwvmi.org, our work, firearm safety page. The League of Women Voters of Michigan Advocacy Committee and Network is part of a coalition led by End Gun Violence Michigan. This coalition consists of faith and community-based organizations, students and educators and their organizations, as well as organizations including the League of Women Voters of Michigan. They are a 501c3 organization that um, heads up the coalition. Our network is developing plans to work with the coalition organizations to educate the community this spring and summer about the impact of the new gun laws on the very citizens that could benefit them. Um, folks just are 
aware of how they can be um, protected through these laws. So that is what the effort is going to be now. And even some law enforcement agencies um, still need to get caught up on the best ways to help folks. So watch for more information in this regard soon. And thank you. And now I'd like to um, turn this over to Connie Mitchell. Connie? Thank you. You've heard a lot of information this evening about a lot of bills that are pending, about a lot of actions we want to take, about a lot of issues in which uh, we are finding ourselves engaged. So the, the question is, what can you do now? What we need to do is remember that action alerts are very, very important. When we communicate with our legislators, it lets them know that they are being watched. We are watching what they are doing. We do have our uh, opinions and we can share our opinions through these action alerts. They're very, very easy to take care of. They're emailed to every member. It's a very simple fill-in form that you can shoot right back via email to the persons that you are addressing them to. They can be found at the League of Women Voters Michigan website under the Take Action button. So if you miss an email, uh, sometimes just go to the website and see if you can find something that you may have missed and take action that way. Finally, we ask you to take action now to support the passage of the Freedom of Information uh, legislation, which are found in Senate Bill 669 and Senate Bill 670. This will open the door to more transparency. My dog will start. Yay! More transparency and would make uh, information available from the offices of any legislator, any commission, and the governor. That way, everyone will be accountable and we will have information that we need in order to make our decisions and move forward with our actions. So ladies, at this point, I would like to also remind you that you can't see it, but I'm wearing a t-shirt that says, democracy is not a spectator um, sport. And on the back, it says in very bold letters, vote. And I love wearing this t-shirt when I'm around other people to remind them that we all have to be in this together to make our democracy what we want it to truly be. And with that, I will turn it back over to Judy. Thank you. We'll go to questions now, if you want to put them in the chat. And just a reminder, you can look up any of these bills at the legislature's website. And I'm going to quit sharing. If I can do that, escape. And um, we'll go to questions. I want to thank the committee for all of their information they've shared tonight and for their commitment to these issues. As you can tell, we could probably do an hour on any of these topics. <laughs> so thank you all, and thank you for participating. Christina, questions? Yes. Ju Judy, there are no questions in the chat. Um, perhaps okay. we can just ask people to raise their hands sure. and and just open up the mic for them, like Mary Jo Dervash. Thank you, first of all, I'm just in awe of, of everything you've done. And thank you so much. I just wanted to share with um, some people who might not know, I, I watched a recent um, National League program um, on emerging issues and overview. And so they went over six um, policy type things, ERA, climate change, gun safety, healthcare, reproductive justice and immigration and talked really about how National um, works on these issues. And I guess I just wanted to encourage people to watch that because now just even as a newsletter person, um, these priorities you know, are, are, are important to me because I think, okay, it's a meeting on climate change. We should probably you know, do something about that. And then also when I was um, working on something else, um, 
I became, well, I, I got an email from Michigan Climate Action Network. And um, so they do have a section um, for organizations involved and I didn't see the league's name. And there's yeah. a whole bunch of other ones and I don't know if, if there's a reason for that. But anyway, but thank you so much, it was wonderful. Thank you. Christina, uh, Judy, this is Marsha Copa. I can't seem to find my hand to raise, but I did put okay. a question in the chat. Um, is there a way of looking up the studies that uh, support the resulting advocacy? It would depend on the issue. Um, <clears throat> there, I mean, I'm not sure what you're looking for specifically. Christina well, mentioned um, the ones about the law, the new information about the laws. And I mentioned the website where Promote the Vote has um, voting information, but I guess I'm not sure what studies you're looking for. Nothing in, nothing specifically right now, but if uh, I get in a conversation with somebody, uh, I would like to have an idea of uh, the pros and cons. You can you know. definitely email us and we could help with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you, can, the, you can also get started by looking at impact on issues the, on the National um, League website. I think it's 2022-24 impact on issues. And then there are positions on lwvmi.org to get your conversation started. But then if you need more information, you um, reach out to Judy probably or any one of us if it's a particular item. I wanted to mention that on the action alert, you might not have noticed, but there's a button for more information. And I try to put studies there and background information or links to the bills in case you've missed that. Okay. Thank you very much. Looks like we have two raised hands over here, Judy. We have Lori and then Ann Sweeney. Lori. Thanks, Christina. I just want to share some very good news. Joanne Richards of the Austin area, Texas League is going to take Michigan's book ban and public library advocacy position to their local league, and they fully intend on taking it to the state league in Texas. Nice. Okay. And? <laughs> uh, oh, yes. Um, my question is on that, the, uh, the action button that's on the... Uh, on the, the state league. So if we decide to take action, are we taking action as league members? Do we have to identify where we are? Or are we just individual citizens? It's individual citizens. Okay. All right. And the letters are editable. So you can make changes if you know, you know, like if you know Senator McBroom and he's your senator, you can thank him for sponsoring it. Uh, that information's in the background, but Yes, you can definitely, it's from you as a constituent. Great, thank you. I'll give it a look. Anybody else? We plan to put this uh, information, the tape from tonight on the website. Connie? Can I have it appropriate to share the action alerts outside of the membership of the LWV? People do, yes. Any other questions? So maybe we should end. I want to thank you all for participating. Um, I know we'll, whoops, sorry, Tricia. I have a question. What if someone who is here today or watches the recording wants to get involved with the advocacy committee. How do, what do they do? It, the committee's appointed by the board, but they can email and next time there's openings, we can 
will know their name. All right. You heard it from and, Judy. <laughs> and, and we encourage you to get involved in the networks. The, um, so we'll plan another meeting probably in June. As you saw, they hope to leave by the end of June. I want to remind you that this is an election year. So the 110 members that we will have soon in the Michigan House will all be up for re-election, which certainly changes the dynamics for the rest of the year, or at least through November. Um, both sides are going to be fighting for a majority. And as you know, the Democrats had it for the first time in 40 years with two seats. And uh, obviously, if they look, if the Republicans get one seat, we'll be tied. If they get two, the Republicans will be in control. The Senate's not up for election this year or the governor. So uh, this will impact, this. the election will greatly well, the campaign during the election year will greatly impact what gets passed during the remaining months, and then we'll have lame duck. So that should be another adventure that we have no idea how to predict. But we'll try to keep you up on everything that's happening with our articles and league links, and with um, another meeting like this, hopefully in June, and we're glad to answer questions anytime. So thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you for your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. And my apologies for the loud dog. I didn't even hear him. <laughs>